Uh, so first of all, I just want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here. You know, my, my PhD alma mater, I have you know, nothing but uh, fond memories of being here as a graduate student and also of the amazing faculty. So, and it's amazing to see sort of the, the growth and the, uh, the, the powerhouse that the department has become over the years. So, okay, so uh, this is the topic. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, photo evaporation of planets, and I promise this is going to be an alien-free talk. As many of you know, I've been doing a lot of work on exo-civilizations, but I couldn't, I just want to put in a plug for this paper, which is uh, the, about the Fermi paradox. And we carried out these really detailed agent-based models um, uh, of the colonization or the settlement of the solar system. And so this is just, you can see this is a galaxy, and what we've done is, I'm going to show you one slide from here, that one star is going to uh, uh, develop a civilization and then send out probes, and that's basically the Fermi paradox, right? That very, in less than one rotation period of the galaxy, everybody gets settled. Uh, so why aren't they here now? So we did some really interesting work in there, I'm not going to tell you about it, but um, you, know, you can look at the paper. Okay. Uh, what I am going to tell you about, though, is work that a number of people have been involved in. It actually kind of started from here because um, uh, with Ian Dobbs Dixon, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, we started thinking about using the code that we built, AstroBear, which is an adaptive mesh refinement MHD code, to try and do something with exoplanets. And at first, we tried to do um, the pl problem of uh, uh, hot Jupiter circulation, and it turned out that our code was the absolute worst code you could possibly pick for that. Um, and instead, we found, after working for a while, found that you could actually, uh, the problem of photo evaporation or planetary mass loss was well suited. So this, the whole group of people here have been helping, uh, has been part of this project. In particular, Alex Debrecht, who is my graduate student, um, has been uh, taking the lead on it. Okay, so what is a uh, photo evaporation or hydrodynamic escape? Basically, it's the idea that you have a star uh, where there's enough EUV and X-ray flux uh, coming from it, that those photons are deposited into the atmosphere, heats the atmosphere up uh, to the point where you drive a Parker-type thermal wind. You get temperatures of around 10,000 degrees. That's enough to allow the material to expand away. Uh, there is a classic formalism for this, actually it goes back to, I believe, 1981, uh, called energy-limited escape, where the mass loss rate from the planet's atmosphere is proportional to the, um, uh, basically to the flux. This is what's important, the flux of the, the XUV flux and the mass of the planet and the radius uh, of the planet. So um, what are the consequences of this? Well, it's very important. Why does this problem, you know, why should you care about this problem? Well, it turns out um, that this actually turned, this may be a fundamental process controlling atmospheres uh, and their evolution and whether or not planets are even habitable or not. So uh, this is this lovely work by Lermer and Catling uh, recently that I just learned about yesterday, and so this little slide will be in my talk from now on. It's just they, I think they did a great job. It's a little difficult for you guys to see here, but um, the plot down here is atmospheric fraction versus time, and you can see that the photo evaporation is just you know, pulling material off. And what you can't see, is not showing up so well, is this, there's a blue line, this is the core, there's a blue line out here, that's the atmosphere, the extended hydrogen atmosphere, and over time, uh, it's, you, know, you can't really see, you know, you're losing mass, you're losing mass, but the size doesn't drop until just about here you can see it's smaller, and by the time you get to uh, 27.1 million years, it's just rocky core. So basically, you can completely strip a super-Earth uh, that has a huge hydrogen atmosphere down to just its rocky core. And this obviously has huge implications for things like habitability, um, but uh, before we even go further on this, there is a clear signature of this process in the um, exoplanet census. This is a plot of uh, the number of planets with orbital periods less than 100 days. This is the planetary radius. And this right here, what you can see, is what's called the uh, photo evaporation valley or desert or the Fulton Gap, because he was the first person to uh, see it. And you see that the number of planets rises steadily up to about 2.5 uh, Earth radius. And then there's this big dip and then there's another rise at around one. And this dip right here, as Lemmer and Ketling has done a very nice job of showing, is because of this process of photoevaporation. There's kind of an instability in the process such that if you're a planet here, you're going to have, you're going to completely remove your atmosphere and land up with just like a very thin atmosphere. Whereas if you're over here, um, uh, you'll retain your atmosphere. So this process can, in principle, take a hot Neptune and burn it down to basically the rocky core. And there's a really interesting problem there, which is like, 
okay, you can, have, you can have terrestrial planets in two ways. They can be built the way the Earth got built, or you can have something that was sitting under a huge amount of volatiles and then was stripped to its core. And what is, you know, are they both equally habitable? Are they, you know, or are they actually fundamentally different kinds of planets? So photo evaporation matters. Now, the, uh, of course, those, that's indirect evidence, right, from the planetary census. Do we have direct evidence? for photo evaporation? The answer is yes, because you can actually see that material as you're heading into a transit. If you've got material being lost from the planet, you'll actually see that uh, during the transit. You may see it actually right even happening before the transit begins. You can see some of that material. Or during the transit, you may be able to catch the Doppler shifted uh, photons coming from the sun that are being absorbed in the, uh, in the atmosphere. So, yes, we do have data. We have about, uh, I think it's up to the eight now, eight examples, only hot Jupiters or, or, or hot Neptunes being, um, uh, 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 you can look at the Lyman alpha photons from the sun being absorbed as they pass through the, uh, this material, this escaping material. But, okay, so these are four examples. These are two hot Jupiters, two uh, hot Neptunes. This is the Lyman alpha line from the star. The, uh, it's, um, it should be sort of double peaked. Um, there's absorption in the center. But here's the important thing. What is the, uh, uh, the escape velocity of material from a hot Jupiter? It should be around 50 kilometers per second. You can't really see this because this is a crappy uh, 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 version of these figures. But all of these absorption peaks, you see there, there's a big absorption region here, this big absorption here. It's at 120 kilometers per second. The, the wind is twice as fast or more than it should be. Not to mention the fact that what we would expect from theory is that they, uh, the absorption on the red and blue side should be about the same, maybe a little bit different, but you know, about the same. And as you can see, it's not the same at all. So we think that photoabsorption is a fundamentally important process, uh, but the data we have doesn't match the theory at all. So that's really interesting. So this is motivation then to try and do fully 3D models with lots of physics, uh, to try and track the process in detail and see what's going on, both because you want to understand fundamentally what's going on. The 1D models, by their nature, are very simplified. But also because we have this enormous problem that the data and the theory just don't match in fundamental ways. OK, so let's talk about the physics of photo evaporation. So what's happening, this is a little schematic of the planetary atmosphere. And down here at the base, you've got the, the surface of the planet, which is you know, one bar, wherever, the, wherever you get to one bar. And then you have photons coming from the star, uh, ionizing photons, and they can penetrate all the way down to the tau equals 1 surface. This basically is where there's an ionization front, essentially, uh, inside the planet's, the, the hot Jupiter's uh, atmosphere. That heats material up. It rises. It begins to expand. At some point, you pass through the sonic point. So now, above this, you have a supersonic wind. So now you have truly have a Parker-style wind flowing away from the planet. Eventually, you pass the hill radius, and there's an interesting question about whether or not you are, the hill radius is above or below the sonic point. But once you're past the hill radius, now you're no longer being dominated by the gravity of the planet, and you're going to be dominated by the gravity of the star. And then somewhere up here is what's called the exobase. We don't need to go through that. But you know, if you want to track this process in detail, you've got to track all, all of this. You need to actually be able to follow the photons coming into the planetary atmosphere, you know, burning their way down and launching the wind. Once you do that, uh, this is also 1D models, what you find is you get a nice, you know, in spherical symmetry, if you considered spherical symmetry, then you get a nice wind where the density falls off with radius and the velocity increases with radius. Okay, so this is just a standard Parker wind. Um, in general, there's this parameter lambda called the escape parameter, which is the ratio of the gravitational energy to the thermal energy. And if lambda is less than 20, you can get a wind. So that's basically what you need. And for hot Jupiters and hot Neptunes, things on, 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 on hot orbits, this is very easy to achieve. OK, so, um, so example for the solar corona has 10 to the 6K, and uh, that gives you a lambda of 15. Typical temperatures in these uh, planetary uh, atmospheres where the photoionization is happening is going to be more like an H2 region. It's going to be about 10,000 degrees. But that's enough to get your lambda below 20. All right, so there has been some previous multidimensional work um, uh, in it, uh, but there have been fewer, uh, 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 there's not been as many of them, and it's only now that the codes are getting to the point where you can do fully 3D work. So here, for example, 
is uh, an early version of this that was done in 2D. You have a planet here that is launching a wind. There's no physics of the launching here. It's just done sort of as a boundary condition. So you're just pushing a wind through here. It's running into a solar or the stellar wind. And you see there's a bow shock separating this, the, the uh, planetary wind from the stellar wind. And that may be important for holding uh, some of this planetary material uh, close to the planet, maybe being used for um, uh, uh, heating of the planet. This is actually the reason people pursued this was uh, maybe the H2 could be a greenhouse gas for the early Earth. This is uh, one of the first fully 3D models by Matsakos et al., 2015. I think it was very groundbreaking work. Um, but, you know, it's only, like I said, in the last few years that there really have been more 3D models. And the reason for that is down here, you need high resolution and you need an accurate treatment of the launch conditions. The models I'm going to show you today are one of the few, there's only about four models that actually track the ionization, actually tra fully track the launching of the wind. Um, the first models I'm going to show you don't do that, the second models do. Okay. All right, so how do we do this? Like the, the only way you really need adaptive mesh refinement for this. So we're using a code uh, called AstroBear. Um, the, don't ask me why it's called AstroBear. It's a long story, but you know, if your code has to have a name, so somehow it ended up being AstroBear. Um, uh, basically, what we're doing is we're solving the MHD equation, so partial partial T of uh, the MHD vector uh, uh, plus uh, the, the fluxes in all three directions with a source term. So these are complex equations, they're nonlinear. Uh, hyperbolic equations, there's no way you're going to be able to solve them uh, fully without the computer. And we also have this constraint that del dot b equals zero. That's a very difficult thing that you have to pay attention to or else you generate monopoles in your code. And doing this with adaptive mesh refinement uh, poses particular challenges. The code is pretty mature now, though. So um, we can not only can do magnetic fields, but we also have source terms. There's the source term over here for things like ionization dynamics, uh, having a real equation of state. Uh, radiative heating and cooling. We can do uh, self-gravity, heat conduction, and then we can also put in sink particles if we're interested in tracking things like accretion. So the code is very general. It's one of these general purpose codes that can be used for lots of different problems um, and has been used for lots of different problems from star formation to uh, planetary nebula. Um, this problem, as I said, you know, we tried first to adapt this code to uh, the dynamics of the hot Jupiter atmospheres, the circulation, wrong code for that. You know, this is the, so that was interesting to find out, that it's general, but not that general. Um, but this problem of, of launching the winds turns out to be right in the sweet spot. So the first thing I'm going to show you are really kind of where we started, where we did global simulations. And by global, I mean, you know, you can sit in a fixed frame and watch the star or the planet orbiting the star. So these simulations will have both the star and the planet in it. But we're not going to do the detailed tracking of the launching. We're going to have boundary conditions on the planet that's going to push material out at the conditions that we think are appropriate. Basically, we're going to push uh, from the planet, um, we're going to push uh, density, uh, material out at a certain density and a temperature of 10,000 degrees and let it expand into a Parker wind. So, um, so we, we're using these uh, wind launching uh, boundary conditions. And what, you know, in order to control the fact that, of course, only the day side of the planet is being photo illuminated, um, we have a boundary condition such that the day side is set to a temperature of 10 to the fourth, and the night side is set to 100 degrees. Um, we use uh, these are pretty high resolution simulations, and we also include ionization and recombination dynamics, particular to uh, track to do synthetic observations. All right, so here, you know, we're going to work our way up in terms of complexity. So these were actually, in some sense, we were testing the code. These are going to be slices through the uh, planet. Um, so there's still there's a star over there. Uh, but right now, um, we'll set it up with uh, this is the density and velocity. In the case where actually our boundary condition is uh, spherically symmetric, and this is the temperature and uh, sonic. This is the, uh, the, soup, the, the sonic surface. And what you see is if you have a spherical boundary condition in terms of the uh, launching, you end up with a spherical wind. Right. Right? And you also, there's your nice spherical sonic surface. So that's where the material is, you know, it's expanding subsonically and then eventually accelerates to the, uh, the uh, m equals 1 at this surface. If we now allow the, set things up so that only this side of the planet is hot, right, you can see this, there's the temperature. This is the hot day side, that's the cold night side. Then you end up with a wind that, if you look at it carefully, you see you're actually, there are pressure gradients which cause the wind to, on this side it flows outward, but um, at higher latitudes, it flows back around. So then you end up with a sonic surface that looks, uh, that, that on this side is where material is flowing out, but some of that material flows back in, and you actually get a shock here as uh, material 
from the day side flows back and coalesces onto the night side. This is just telling you that this boundary condition is doing kind of what it needs to in terms of uh, producing an aspherical wind. And now we can step back and try and do more global simulations and watch as the planet uh, orbits around the star. This just gives you, this is pretty much the appropriate scale, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so this is the planet. Uh, this is the star. This is the planet. There we have uh, just a couple of radii we'd want to note. This is the Hill sphere. So in this case, we have the Hill sphere inside the sonic radius. This is the bow, uh, the bow shock radius, which is basically, we have a stellar wind in this as well. This is where the stellar wind and the planetary wind will uh, pretty much uh, meet, and uh, that's where the standoff distance will be. And this is the distance that we call the uh, Coriolis length that I'll tell you about in a minute. Okay, so that's the, the layout. Now let's look at the simulation. Okay, so what you're seeing here is red is the star. There's a big, that white dot in the center is just the boundary condition inside the star. The white dot that's going around is the planet, and the green is the wind coming off of the planet. So the first thing you notice from this is this doesn't really look like maybe what you expected, right? You might have expected the wind to kind of expand he hemispherically. Um, so actually, maybe a better way of looking at this is in the co-rotating frame of the planet. The wind is not expanding sort of in three dimensions. It's ending up sort of forming, it's going into orbit around the star. You're ending up with kind of a torus, a loose torus of material orbiting the star. And this was really kind of remarkable. This is not what we expected. I've done lots of simulations of interacting binary winds when you've got a star, maybe even a very tight binary. One star is producing wind, another star is producing wind. It does not produce that, that kind of distribution. You end up with two kind of hemispheres of uh, outflow. So this global flow that you see ends up with this very particular two-arm pattern. You have what we call a forward or an up-orbit arm, uh, and then a backward or down-orbit arm. So here's the star. Here's the planet. This is the up-orbit arm, because the orbit is going this way. This is the down-orbit arm. And this is looking from the side, and you see the wind is really confined to this torus. right? So this is six different views, or five different views, and then the average. So you see there's definitely variations in it, but... Um, uh, it's you know pretty much the, this pattern uh, uh, maintains. Um, so there's you know there's variations, but the up orbit down orbit arm uh, down orbit pattern doesn't change. So it's quasi steady state. Okay, but this up orbit down orbit arm is really the most dominant part of the feature. This is uh, streamlines done in a really kind of a cool way. We take the density and we uh, use that as and then um, uh, we apply a, a noise pattern and then use the streamlines to stretch it out. So you're seeing both density and streamlines here. So, you know, uh, obviously this is, the de this is the star, this is the planet, this is the densest part of the wind, but then it expands around and actually retains a fair amount of density as it, because it's, you know, the material is not geometrically diluting, it's filling up this donut, basically, in the orbit around the, the, the star. So if everybody is cool with that, I'll go on to the next one, but I just wanted to really burn this image into your head of the flow pattern, because this is going to be maintained in all, this kind of flow pattern is generic. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. Um, uh, there's some deceleration going on. It's not really clear. We're not entirely clear about what that, that pattern, what drives that pattern. It may be um, uh, actually, what is it, the L, which point, which L point is this? Um, uh, like a, the Trojan, you know, it may be related to the, which point, is that the L? What? L4, thank you. Yeah, we L4. So it may be related to that, but it's also related to the fact that the, um, uh, there is a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability that seems to be formed. When you look at the details, that seems to form up here that breaks. So, so. Uh, this, if you look at the detail, this is the flow in detail around the, uh, the planet, and you can see it's very complicated. Um, uh, and so, you know, actually in the paper, we tried to work out why you got these sort of various kinds of features. Um, and there's some work you can do by looking at the orbital elements of where the material is launched, um, but I'm not going to focus on that. But I just wanted you to see the, 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 the complexity there. All right, so obviously the first question you want to ask is, why? Why is there this up-orbit and down-orbit pattern? And the uh, question can be addressed in a bunch of different ways. You can do orbital dynamics, look at angular momentum conservation, et cetera. Um, but also the simplest kind of way is to think about Coriolis, the Coriolis force, right? These things are very rapid. These planets are on, you know, sh very short orbits. So the planet is orbiting very uh, rapidly. Um, and so, you know, the, you launch the wind, and very quickly the Coriolis force is going to uh, 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 bend it away from a radial orbit. And so what we were able to do is sort of uh, uh, define a parameter, which was a cor Coriolis length that can be expressed as, um, if we do it in terms of the orbital length, A, uh, turns out to be the mass divided by the mass of the planet 
divided by the radius of the planet, its orbit squared, um, and then uh, the, ma the sum of the mass of the planet and the mass of the star, and then uh, with a cubed up here. What this comes down to is it depends on both the orbital radius of the planet and q, the mass ratio. And this explains why we've never seen this in binary stars, because binary stars have A's that are, or sorry, Q's that are a tenth, maybe, right? Binary stars, you know, you'll get difference between the masses. Um, but uh, uh, here we're getting very, very small um, Q's, right? The, the, this is a planet. It's a thousandth of the mass of the star or less. Uh, and so the Q is very small, and then A is very small. And that is what allows R to be a significant fraction of the orbital radius, OK? So uh, in that case, and you can see this, so this Coriolis, when the Coriolis length becomes similar to the orbital length, then as a, a gas parcel leaves the planet, it's going to be turned very, uh, very quickly, relatively quickly. So here are, uh, if you just calculate, don't do full simulations, but just calculate sort of ballistic trajectories, you can sort of get an idea of what the, and launch it, uh, launch the uh, uh, gas parcels at different uh, um, locations on the planet, what you see is, so here's the bundle of gas parcels for uh, a, that, uh, that Coriolis parameter being, um, uh, sorry, I mean, it's the other way around. If it should be small, R over A should be small. So when uh, it's small, you see that, the, yeah, you get things going into orbit around the star. As you increase uh, R relative to omega, then what you find is you get more and more spherical distribution. So if you were out far enough, then you should have a pretty spherical wind. OK, spherical, in this case, I'm not worrying about the day-night uh, difference. But, the, but the, um, the Coriolis force becomes less important relative to the orbit as you go further out. So that explains why we get the up-orbit and down-orbit pattern. Um, and this can be pretty important for things like, uh, this is a paper that Alex, my student Alex, did last year. Uh, if you look at WASP-12b, there is a very curious lack of stellar emission lines uh, from that system, no matter when you're looking, during transit, off transit. And this has been very strange, because these are the star is such that you would absolutely expect uh, the emission lines. And so the, what they posited before they'd ever seen our work was that there was an obscuring torus of material surrounding the star. But of course, how did it get there? Well, with this pattern, it shows that you know, with the, two, the up orbit, down orbit pattern, it explains why it happens, is that you fill up over time. And that's what this is. This is the, uh, the density. This is just showing you the density in that orbit, in that torus, as a function of time. And we can only do for uh, you know, 50 orbits or so. But eventually, after about 10,000 years, you'll fill up that torus to the point where you have the density that uh, Fossetti uh, at, at all needed to be able to block the stellar emission line. So in that way, you know, this, is, this, can, this process could be very useful for explaining certain anomalous um, uh, uh, tr uh, transit uh, observations. Now, of course, what we really want to do is we want to be able to look at, do synthetic observations of these to compare directly with the data. So we've set up a pipeline, basically, where we are com uh, uh, computing the neutral hydrogen fraction and then sending Lyman alpha photons through it to see the, from the star to look for the, uh, the absorption and see how that absorption compares to what we're seeing. I showed you those, uh, that data from uh, HST before. And you can do this at different angles, uh, and that corresponds to different transit, uh, different transit times, before the transit, during the transit, after. So that's what you're seeing here, depending on this is an angle of 34 degrees, which would be you know, eight hours before the transit, zero degrees, um, which would be uh, zero you know, right during the transit, or eight hours after the transit. And so when you look at observations, these are synthetic Lyman alpha profiles. And the, uh, of course, the, the, the problem with Lyman alpha is that there is coronal, there's various kinds of absorption already happening in the, at, in the uh, interstellar medium. So you never get to see this region here, right? Um, you only get to see this region out here. Um, but if you look at what we have, like, well, OK, we do actually see absorption. So the black line is just what you'd have without the presence of the, any material from the planet. And you see that there is significant absorption. These are at different times, minus eight hours uh, uh, during transit, plus eight hours. And you see that there is actually you know, quite a bit of absorption even before and after the transit. But notice the velocity. The absorption is, is peaking uh, at 50 kilometers per second or so, not 100 kilometers per second. And remember that the data uh, was showing uh, absorption at 120 kilometers per second for a lot of those. So this is theory, and theory and observations you know, are just simply not matching. 
Now, how could you bring them into line? What physics didn't we have in those simulations? And one piece of physics that people have claimed can produce these larger velocities, as well as the asymmetries, is radiation pressure. That you have photons coming from the star that hit the uh, neutral material, and it is, absorbs it, and then drives, uh, the, radi drives the, the, uh, the stellar wind material back. Now, when people have done, mostly when people have done these simulations of this work, they treat the radial force from the uh, radiation as being just a reduction uh, of the gravity force, right? They're both radial, so, you know, it's the simplest way to do this. And so you can see here, if you do that, we, again, we're going to use uh, an analytic model where we're just uh, uh, doing ballistic launching. And you can see when alpha is equal to, um, uh, to 1, where we don't reduce uh, the, uh, the gravity at all, then, yeah, you get the two-arm pattern. But now as we allow the radiation pressure to counteract uh, gravity so that alpha is 0.9, you can see that the up-orbit arm disappears. And then if alpha is 0.8, you completely lose the up-orbit arm, and you get a cometary flow, right? So that's like, oh, radiation pressure, that solves the problem. The only problem with this is that this is applying the, uh, the gravity reduction to the entire domain, as if every part of the, uh, the flow felt the radiation pressure. But these are ionized flows, and you can't, you know, there's no radiation pressure from, uh, for an ion. It's only the neutral material which is going to feel it. So unless you do the radiative, the in, you know, uh, uh, on the flight uh, radiative uh, transfer calculation while the gas is expanding away, you know, you have to track where the neutrals are and then let the photons interact only with those neutrals and see what's going to happen. So that's the flaw with these models. So I'm going to show you at the end uh, the work we're just doing now is we just have a paper on doing the full radiative transfer calculation to see whether or not radiation pressure solves this enormous and glaring dis uh, uh, disparity between the observations and theory. All right, but before we get there, we have to sort of figure out how can we get this code to do the full radiative launching? How can we actually start from photons coming from the star, have them hit the atmosphere, and do the launching? And it's, a very, it's a very difficult problem computationally because it's, it's costly, right? You have to resolve the planet. You have to actually resolve the full you know, uh, 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 planet where you have to have an atmosphere sitting there that is a reservoir that you can burn photons into and still have enough material you know, underneath to keep resupplying um, uh, material that can be launched. So the way we got around that for this first cut was we we're going to go into the co-rotating frame. We're going to not do any global simulations where we're tracking both the star and the planet. We're just going to sit in the co-rotating frame of the planet so we can focus our computational energies on the planet and allow photons from the star to come in and do kind of a plain parallel calculation, just tracking the photons as they move through the grid and hit the star. So that means now we're solving not only the fluid equations, right? But now we are also going to have terms uh, for gain and loss of uh, energy. And that's where the heating is going to come from when we include photoionization, that we're going to be able to heat the atmosphere and get it to uh, 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 launch into a wind. It means we're going to have to track the advection of neutrals and ions. So we're going to have we're going to have to track these different species and calculate their changes. We're going to have to do the rate equations, which are right here, the rate equations for ionization and the rate equations for recombination. We're also going to have to do the radiation transfer. We're going to have to where photons are traveling through the grid. They're going to have to accumulate optical depth. Um, so that will have to be put in there as well. And then we need heating and cooling as well. So, uh, you know, the heating just comes from the ionization, but we also are going to have cooling due to recombination, and we'll also include heating due to Lyman alpha. Because as it turns out, we're going to see is that under some cases, the, um, that, remember I showed you that mass loss rate equation, that, that the rate of mass loss from the, in 1D models, you can use the, what's called the energy limited uh, model. And that's where all the photon energy goes into launching the wind. But recombination and, and radiative recombination and radiative cooling can steal some of that energy. Some of that energy can be radiated out into space, in which case, you know, it's not going into launching the wind. And you can have a pretty significant reduction in the mass loss rate under those conditions. So we need to be able to track that as well. Okay, so these were, this paper was really a parameter space exploration. And we were just, you know, we were interested now, we're interested in getting the code to work. And then interested in sort of seeing how the, uh, the simulations would respond. Remember that nobody else has done this before, right? This is sort of, the, this, there was one paper that had been done before, and it only examined one case, and it did it, uh, was not able to sort of track. And there was no, there was no, the planet wasn't orbiting the star. So we're really just trying to see what's, you know, what the possibilities are here. So um, this is, you don't need to go through this in any detail, obviously, uh, but these are our initial conditions. We have a pretty extended 
uh, planet to, to our Jupiter's uh, ra Jupiter radii. Um, uh, there's not much in here that is of interest except down for here. Basically, we're going to do four cases. A low mass planet with a low flux from the star, a high mass planet with a, a low mass, a low flux from the star, and then low mass, high flux, high mass, high flux. So four different cases changing mass and stellar flux. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so let's first what comes. Oh, so first thing we're going to do to test that everything works is we're going to move the planet so far out that I don't have to worry about the Coriolis force. Okay, this is this is actually relevant because imagine you had a Jupiter around an O star, right, where there was you know significant ionizing flux from the uh, from the star, but the, it's a very you know it's a slowly rotate or orbiting planet. Uh, but mainly we did this just to test that things would work. So in this movie, there's temperature, density, and velocity. This is the neutral density, pressure, and uh, the black line here is the tau equals one surface. The purple line is the Mach number. So let's just look at this for a while. Look at temperature. The first thing you see is as we uh, turn on the, um, we have to start again. When we uh, turn the simulation on, you get this nice wind that emerges from the day side, right? Mainly from the day side, and then expands uh, around it. Um, what's really interesting is the development of this neutral tail, right? So the night side, there's, you're not being photoionized, and that material is cold and neutral. It still gets warm enough to be able to launch, but it launches, if you look at the sonic, look at the sonic, uh, uh, the Mach number, the M equals one surface. This stuff is all subsonic. So you get this cold, slowly uh, expanding neutral tail uh, uh, running behind it. And so that is going to be actually interesting for later on. Um, but the main thing you see is it works, right? We're able to launch a wind that has many of the kinds of conditions that we think we should have had. So now, all right, so let's just look at this in a little more detail. Density, neutral fraction, temperature, and this is one of these streamlined plots. Um, so the most important thing here is, again, this black line here is the uh, tau equals one surface. So you're getting the tau equals one surface burns its way into the, the, the planet on the day side, but then there's this shadow that's cast, right? That's the main thing you expect to happen in something like this. You're going to cast a, a shadow, and in that shadow is where you have neutral material. That's your neutral tail. Um, and you can see this in the temperature as well. There's the, the colder material behind the, um, the planet. All right, now we're going to take the same simulation. This is the low mass, low flux case, by the way. We're going to take the same simulation, and we're going to put it in a hot orbit. We're going to put it on a relatively short, approximately uh, three-day orbit. And what do we get? OK, you immediately see the formation of the up orbit and down orbit arms. Remember that the star, in this case, this is the rotating frame. So the star is over here. The photons are coming in from this direction. And uh, what you see is you know really interesting flow pattern. You get the up orbit. You get material flowing up orbit or down orbit. But now the neutral tail, what's because not only because the Coriolis force, some of this material is cycling around and coming back this way. And it's pushing the neutral tail downstream. Right? And you can even see this in the tau equals one surface. You're actually, that material is being pushed down. And so the, the, uh, the tau equals one surface, the ionization front actually sort of moves downwind. Uh, a little bit, or downstream a little bit. Uh, which is interesting, because what it says is you've got neutral material out here that you might be able to see, right? If you're looking from uh, over here, some of this neutral material won't just be in the shadow. It actually has been pushed down enough now that maybe observations would be able to, to detect uh, uh, the neutral tail in that case. So what's interesting here is we're seeing that the um, there, by adding the full 3D uh, launching, we're actually seeing some features that we hadn't seen before. This is just. Uh, same, this is just the uh, uh, still images of that looking down orbit and then looking from the side. L notice from the side how, yeah, all of the wind is now confined to a torus. All of it. There's no material that doesn't get above or below it. It all ends up in this donut that circulates around the, the star. Um, I won't go into any other details here. Uh, it's not that important or it's not uh, necessary for what we're doing. Okay, so. Um, now that you have these simulations, one of the questions you can ask is about the difference between the energy limited and the uh, uh, radiation or radiation rad recombo limited uh, uh, regime, or which one are we in? And the important thing is from analytics, you can find that in the energy limited case, the mass loss rate should go linearly with the flux, the UV flux. And in the radiation recombo limited, uh, or radiation, sorry, re yeah, rad recombo limited case, where you're losing some energy into uh, photons that disappear, you have a, um, the, the dependence is, uh, goes as to the one half, flux to the one half, right? Because again, some of that energy, some of that, the, the stellar photons, uh, that energy is being lost to radiation. So where are we, 
right? Are we in the energy limited case or are we in the rad recombo case? And this is a plot as a function of distance. The, star, the planet is right here. Um, this is various terms in the heating and cooling. Uh, so let's go through this. P, this is uh, energy due to PDV work, geometric dilution. Right? There's the energy that the gas, the thermodynamic energy that the gas is applying to expand. This actually acts as a cooling. And you can see it's on the negative side here. Right? So that's what's dominating the cooling. Here's the cooling from Lyman alpha and from recombination, much smaller than radiative uh, than, than uh, expansion. Here's the heating term, which is due to ionization. That's obviously the only one we have. But you can just see from this that clearly you are in an energy limited regime. Not totally energy limited, but that's the dominant terms here. That, that really, it's, uh, you're not losing a huge amount to radiation. And now if we look at the uh, different cases and look at what m dots that we got, when we, you know, we can calculate the m dot that comes out of our simulations, and we can track, see how, track to see how, the, how it's changing with flux, and what we find is that approximately, you know, we only have a few uh, cases, but the uh, m dot is scaling as the flux to the 0.9. So much closer to, remember, the energy limited case is linear with flux. Um, the uh, rad recombo case is to the square root. So we're much, clear, we're clo much closer, to, in this case, uh, to the uh, energy, energy limited. We're now working on trying, it's harder actually because of uh, resolution constraints to get to the radiation recombo limited case. Okay. So uh, the thing I will close up on for the next 10 minutes or so is radiation pressure, right? So, so we, you know, the code works. Uh, we could, it could does a nice job of being able to simulate and track the evolution of these, uh, of the full self-consistent radiative launching um, conditions. And now we want to add, now let's use the code to answer a question. Can radiation pressure account for the, the discrepancy we see between theory and observations. Remember, there's a whole series of papers by Schneider et al. that claim that it can. They're using that alpha formalism where in the code they just basically reduce gravity. They don't have a radiation pressure term. They just have a gravity term that they redu reduce by that alpha term where alpha is less than one. So that means what we now need to do is we now need to add a forcing term, a radiative forcing terms to our momentum equation. Um, and uh, this is the forcing term, so it's just basically how well you're doing at capturing photons, uh, stellar photons. Um, and now what we can do is we can make, you know, so, so here's the question. How much flux do you need from the star and the UV to actually, you know, blow this material away? Particularly what we're thinking is we're going to get a cometary tail that removes the up-orbit arm. So you can do a simple calculation where you just ask, um, I've got, you can just take a torus that's constantly being fed by the, the stellar wind, right? So, or the planetary. You got the, the planetary wind, which is driving that torus of material that's orbiting the star. And you can ask, what, how much flux, how many stellar photons do I need to actually remove that, right? So, um, so when you, you know, you have the, the m dot is the here is the m dot of the uh, of the planet, the planetary wind. The delta v here is the escape velocity from the star, because you want this torus that's orbiting the star to be removed. So you can then calculate a threshold flux, and what we find is the threshold flux should be about eight times ten to the fourteen uh, four photons per cubic centimeter. Yeah, that should be the, um, or sorry, for, for centimeter squared, that's, it should be a flux. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Oops. Um, Okay, so uh, let's. So that's the flux. That's our analytic prediction. Now let's build simulations that sort of you know are above this and below this and see what where we get. So we're going to run uh, simulations. In this case, we're really going to try and model an actual planet, and it's HD two hundred six. Blah blah blah. I can never remember the other. It's yeah, maybe that. What he said. Yeah, it's the mo it's the first one that was discovered. So you know, then it's very well carried. HD two hundred HD two hundred nine. Uh, but it's very well characterized in terms of radius, et cetera. So we know what its parameters are. So in this case, as you can see here, the, um, what's common to all these runs is the radius of the planet, and it's 1.5 Jupiter radii. I remember the other one was like almost twice as large as that, because computationally it was much easier to have a big puffy planet. Um, so uh, uh, we've got a fairly small Jupiter as these things go, or hot Jupiter as these things go, a uh, mass of 0.73. Um, I won't go into the other details, they're not important. The thing we want to watch is we're going to do three runs where we're below the threshold, kind of around the threshold, and ten times above the threshold, right? So this is going to be our low, intermediate, and high flux cases. And we want to see do any of these produce, in any of these cases, does any, anything happen? So here's our low flux case. This is pressure, um, uh, the, um, 
uh, the neutral, neutral fraction. This is density and velocity vectors. And this is just, this is the um, uh, acceleration produced by the Lyman alpha photons from the star. And the first thing you notice is that, OK, well, it, it, you'll notice that this, this uh, simulation looks different from the big fat planet case. Uh, and that's because, you know, for the, I could go into it it's for various reasons that when the star, or when the planet is much more compact, you're getting much more tidal forces are playing a, uh, a stronger role. And that leads to these more narrow up orbit and down orbit arms. Um, notice also you get a pretty large extended neutral tail, which again may be of interest for observations. But the main thing you see is that the photons aren't doing anything, right? I mean, you see a little bit of compression of the flow as time goes on. You can see certainly that photons are being absorbed, but they simply don't have enough power to move the flow. They you know, basically are absorbing, and you kind of have a Lyman alpha ionization front inside the, uh, or in the, the forward edge of the stream of the, of the wind, the torus, but nothing else is happening. OK, here's the, the medium case, same thing. Medium case and the, uh, the wait, let me just go back. The low alpha case and the medium alpha case, uh, Lyman alpha case, basically the same thing. No change. You just you can't push it. Okay? And it's more like the medium case is, even, is relatively high for what they think uh, the star from HD 206 blah, blah, blah is uh, producing. Um, so already, the, already our threshold, EK, our medium case, is too high compared to what you, what you think is coming from these stars. But the high case is definitely higher than you, could, uh, than you would expect. So low and intermediate, um, no reaction. Now let's put in the high flux case. And here you see that the up orbit arm does get driven backwards, right? But that's not the end of the story. Look, you start to see the, uh, the arm, the up orbit arm reasserting itself. So I don't have, I need a longer movie of these. But what you basically see, you end up with a periodic flow, that the up orbit arm gets blown backwards, it tries to reassemble itself, and then gets blown backwards again. So we actually have a periodic flow in this case. Um, and you can see at least the, 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 the one cycle here um, uh, over time as the, uh, so this starts, you've already, here you've already, uh, again, this is looking down uh, on the orbit, this is looking from the side. So looking down, you see this is already, you've already uh, blown the up orbit arm back. You've got the cometary, ta a cometary feature, where it looks like a cometary tail. And then the flow, again, tries to uh, start uh, recreating the up orbit arm. Eventually, the Lyman alpha compresses it, blows it backwards, and there's a, a, a cycle here. Um, so yeah, so for the high flux case, this works. But the high flux case is so high that you know, it's going to be really hard. It's, 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 this really just doesn't work for what we think are the fluxes for, um, for uh, realistic hot, uh, uh, the host stars of hot Jupiters. Now, sometimes what it's important to sort of note this. It, you know, we're using a hydro uh, code. How collisional? You, know, you can't use a hydro code unless you're collisional. So you know, we wanted to explicitly calculate the collisionality of the flow. So we calculated the Knudsen number, which is the ratio of the mean free path to the scale of interest in the problem, which in this case is the, the scale height of the planet. And what we find is that um, uh, the Knudsen number, we're everywhere. And we, show, you know, we use both hard. We imagine these things are just you know, marbles. And we also, you know, the, which, the more realistic case, because you've got a lot of ions, or mostly ions, is, a, um, is to use uh, electrostatic or proton-proton collisions. Um, and what you find is that you're, you're pretty collisional all the way through. So um, it doesn't really matter. So, so that, that's good to know. All right, if we look at the synthetic observations from this for the, the, the four cases, or three cases, no Lyman alpha flux, uh, which is also the same thing as the low case, intermediate and high, this is, uh, again, velocity. Uh, the black line is the stellar case undisturbed, or the, the, the stellar case with no uh, 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 material. And what you see is, again, you get for the, for the low or no Lyman alpha flux case, you get a little bit of absorption, uh, which might be noticeable. But again, you're only at you know, 50 kilometers per second. Intermediate case, same thing out at these wings. And it's only in the high case that you actually see stronger absorption and a much bigger difference between the, um, uh, the, the two wings. And even there, it's not that significant. So it doesn't look anything like the observation. Remember the observations? You were just, one of those wings was just gone, right? Uh, so, so, you know, the conclusion here is that this just doesn't work, right? So if you actually look at, uh, so this is, uh, if you actually look at where the, you know, where the velocity is, this is 
these are, in this plot, uh, these are again for the three cases looking from the top, looking from the side. The contours are of density. Uh, this is the, the, the colors are velocity, going from 10 kilometers to 100 kilometers. And what you see is under no cases here do you ever see 100 kilometer material, right? You see a little bit of material here. These colors here are maybe get you up to like 30, 40, 45, right there. So here you see some material being etched, being eroded over the top and bottom of that torus at about 40 kilometers per second. But that's it. So radiation pressure simply is not the answer to, to the conundrum, right, the disparity. Um, so what do we have left? Well, right now one possibility is charge exchange, where you're getting uh, fast ions from the stellar wind interacting with the cold neutrals, you know, the cold, slow neutrals from the planetary wind. They charge exchange, and then so what we're really seeing in the, that observation is not planetary wind at all. We're seeing, you know, neutral, uh, we're seeing stellar wind that has, you know, eaten uh, or, or stolen an electron. So we're working on those models right now. Um, okay, so that's the story with the simulations uh, up to this point. The um, important, the last thing I want to leave you with is magnetic fields. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, we have a couple papers that we're working on now. Magnetic fields can change things considerably. Here is a simulation. The green lines are uh, magnetic field lines being stretched out. You have a, we're taking a dipole field and allowing the wind to stretch it out. One of the problems with doing the simulations in the local box is you can see once the field lines get to the edge of the box, you start generating all kinds of numerical problems and you have to uh, quit the simulation. Um, so that's why you know it's what we're working on right now to try and uh, uh, get past that, and I think we're just about done with that. Here is a uh, um, the strong field case. So this is this is beta of 10, where the field is relatively weak, and you see it's stretched out like spaghetti. Here's the beta of 0.1, and it still gets stretched out like spaghetti, uh, but in a different way. And what you also see here is that you get a, you can get a, a fairly high reduction, at least by a factor of um, almost 10. Uh, in some of these simulations, of the mass loss rate. The, the wind, the field really constrains where the mass loss uh, occurs. Okay, so I'm going to, just to, for conclusions, so hot planetary winds can have complex flow geometries, um, and that, that's why you need to do 3D, and these are governed by the Coriolis and tidal forces, radiation dynamics, uh, radi and that radiation dynamics, I mean what's happening in the, the atmosphere where you're launching the wind, uh, radiation pressure, little star there, it has some effects, but it's not a huge effect. Magnetic field probably has a huge effect, but that still needs to be shown. Um, and the observational characterization of the planetary winds uh, is possible, but the interpretation is difficult in the sense that we're getting the wrong, you know, we, we have data, but we're getting the wrong answer. So the question is, what is the right answer? Lots of open questions here for the future. I mean, I think this is really, this field is just growing. I've explained to you why this is an important problem. This may be a crucial process for setting an atmosphere and therefore setting habitability. Um, you know, even, you don't have to be in a hot orbit for this to matter. Venus may have lost its water through this process by, you know, you, you got the material up to high enough where you got photo dissociation of water and then the hydrogen was launched into a wind. And so the hydrogen left and that was it for water. So, you know, this may have been a, a fundamental process but, uh, when the sun was younger and it had higher uh, fluxes. So um, it's a pretty important question. So lots of open questions for MHD and radiation physics. And I will stop there, and I thank you very much for your time.